Good morning, everyone. Uh, so my name is Pierre Moulin. I'm President and CEO of uh, Genome Canada. I'd like to thank uh, Jeff and Eric for uh, inviting us uh, to give uh, a, a little bit of um, uh, information on what we're doing in, in Canada regarding the uh, implementation of um, personalized uh, medicine, personalized health. Uh, I'd just like to uh, acknowledge uh, that we do everything uh, in, uh, in personalized health uh, with uh, colleagues from the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, and Paul Lasko is here uh, this morning, and I also have my colleague uh, Cindy Bell also is also from Genome Canada in, uh, in the audience. So um, what I'd like to do uh, today is to give you a very quick introduction to the Canadian uh, healthcare environment because this is the receptor into which we're going to translate stuff and I think it's very important that we understand what that receptor is like, what its culture is in order for us to do that. Then I'll tell you a little bit about genomics in Canada and then go right into the meat of the presentation which will be on a program that we have designed with our colleagues from CIHR uh, in uh, genomics and personalized health, which we launched uh, in 2012, and then a few conclusions and looking forward. So in terms of the Canadian environment, it's a publicly funded healthcare system. It's provincially delivered uh, uh, through a series of regional health authorities. So the regional health authorities are the payers of the systems, and they decide to a great deal what gets funded and what doesn't get funded in terms of technologies and so on and so forth. It costs the country around 200 billion per year. Growth is currently around the 3% annually, and given the general economic growth, this is not sustainable. But we know that biomedical research is very strong in Canada. In fact, we spend roughly 2% of global research, but produce 4% of the highest impact factor uh, publications. Uh, and we also have very strong clinical networks. A lot of those were funded through the CIHR. Uh, body and uh, th for some diseases uh, has among the best outcomes in the world uh, through those uh, networks. But the challenges are really our ability to move the latest technology into the healthcare system, which we do not have a very good track record of doing. Uh, and new technologies are often seen from the payer standpoint as just an added cost. Uh, and economic analyses performed are not obviously convincing enough for the payer to. Um, to uh, adjust their, uh, uh, their, their offer. So in terms of genomics, and we've benefited, I guess, from a sustained, focused investment from uh, the government over the last 13 years. Uh, we were kind of uh, playing catch up to uh, a little bit of a, uh, uh, a degree. And we're organized, we look like the federal provincial government because we organized Genome Canada and six administrative regional genome centers. And their job is really to monitor large scale projects and fundraise for us through uh, looking for provincial dollars and other dollars that, that we can uh, match federal uh, dollars with. We also have five science and technology innovation centers, and they're the big uh, either DNA sequencing centers or proteomics or metabolomics and I'll be talking a little bit about those and their role in some of these projects. Uh, and we've invested about two uh, billion dollars. One billion has come from the federal uh, government um, uh, over the last uh, decade and a bit, and one billion then from other sources, including uh, the provinces. Um, I'll just tell, talk a little bit about some of the challenges with translating uh, new technologies. Uh, because obviously we're not going to translate something that it has not been clinically validated. And, and something like DNA sequencing, where there are multiple platforms, where the technology is probably, some platforms are more stable than others, and there will be new platforms coming uh, forward as, as we go forward because the technology is moving so fast. So that decision point as to when to transfer is going to be a, a key one. And then we have to ask the questions, well, uh, once again, the receptor in terms of the clinical laboratory structures, are they going to be turned upside down and what are the implications for that? And who will be making these decisions and based on what criteria in terms of technology assessment uh, based on sound economics and clinical benefit and who will pay for, uh, for this stuff? So we decided then with uh, talking with our, our colleagues at uh, CIHR that what we needed in Canada was some kind of demonstration 
that one, the technology can deliver real value to patients, and two, integrating this technology within the healthcare system would be cost effective. And so we decided that we would design a program, and this is where uh, we're hoping for some value add from a funder perspective, in terms of we had to make sure that the right team is, is going to be formed to do this translation, that the right deliverables are achieved, and that we uh, have, we ensure true demonstrations of value uh, that, are, uh, that are, are obtained. And obviously that is then linked with how you organize, not only design the RFA, but organize the review panel, which was uh, very, very critical. So in um, 2012, then we came together with our colleagues at CIHR and designed uh, a new program. This was a major partnership between the two organizations. We pooled uh, together $65 million of uh, our monies and we were able to leverage that up to $150 million through partnerships. And it was very interesting that uh, obviously having a Genome Canada CIHR partnership uh, in, in this area uh, was a focal point for others who were interested in personalized health and uh, we were able to attract other investments into this uh, pool. So going from 65 to 150 was, uh, I think, a, a good, um, it, 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 it obviously demonstrated that uh, w we could uh, attract others and that others were very interested in joining us in our, in our efforts here. So I'm going to just skip over this one and t tell you a little bit about the key features of uh, this uh, competition. Um, we insisted that the, the project teams come with a rationale and an economic analysis for why the particular application that they were proposing would add value to the healthcare system. We insisted that uh, the assembling of the team and who those people were, including you know, end users, uh, health authority personnel, who would actually be the pull mechanism for some of these technologies. And a detailed development plan was required to uh, demonstrate the integration into the healthcare system, including engagement by end users, considerations of the regulatory framework existing in Canada, and then looking at challenges and barriers to translation that we put under uh, the GELS acronym, and I'll, I'll tell you, I have a, a specific slide on, on that. So GELS are the genomics and its ethical, environmental, economic, legal, and social aspects. I think you have similar programs in, in your own countries, uh, probably called a little bit differently. And this traditionally in, in Genome Canada language has been uh, related uh, research undertaken from the perspective of the social sciences and humanities disciplines. In the context of this RFA, it was extended to cover researchers in the fields of health administration, health management, health services research, health technology assessment evaluation, and comparative effectiveness studies. And those were integrated into the project um, in a mandatory way. Uh, there also was a possibility of a standalone project uh, which would only deal with GELS aspects of, uh, of this technology. And we're also going to bring the, the uh, successful applicants together uh, early next year, uh, or early this year, rather, um, to talk about, uh, do a bit of cross-fertilization and, and testing of, to see if there are common themes about common barriers, common issues uh, of uh, translation that we could uh, fund uh, some, uh, some further uh, GELS type activities uh, in, uh, in this domain. So the review was in two phases. We had 146 uh, pre-applications uh, that were reviewed by a, a, a very large group of people. And full proposals, there were four, that was um, uh, whittled down to 40 uh, full uh, proposals, and they were reviewed by uh, 40 international translational researchers, social scientists, and health economists. Uh, the panel chair was Raju Kushalapati from Harvard Medical School, and I know that some of you were also involved in the, in the process. Jeff was involved in the process, and Howard McLeod was involved in the process. 
and, and others may, may, may have been that I, I'm not recognizing. Uh, and, but that review uh, of full proposals took place over three days with face-to-face -face meetings between members of the review panel and project team applicants. And the review criteria were obviously research merit, but also, very importantly, socioeconomic benefits, finance, and management. And those review criteria were measured, uh, were reviewed equally. So it wasn't as if we were saying, well, yeah, the research merit is more important than the social economic benefit. No, you could fail a project on any, any of the criteria. Uh, and we ended up funding 17 projects that are now, uh, have been all launched and with an average uh, size of, uh, dollar size of 8.8 .8 million. Uh, so there are some that are 12 million, there are some that are 6 million. Uh, but uh, in, in the, that's the uh, average side size. And we traditionally in Genome Canada have always been milestone driven uh, uh, in terms of our, how we manage our projects that are closely monitored by personnel at the genome centers. Uh, we've, we've introduced uh, with our partners a new uh, type of uh, oversight committee as well for this competition. And that oversight committee, the ROC, uh, reports to the funders uh, on progress, provides advice to the project teams, and helps ensure teams focus on reaching project milestones and uh, objectives. So I, I'm, I'm just, I think I have a few minutes, 2.40 exactly, uh, to tell you a little bit about uh, some of the projects. First of all, we were uh, pleasantly surprised at the uh, broad scope of the disease areas that were funded. We thought at the beginning, is it just going to be cancer and, uh, uh, and, and pharmacogenomics? But no, it's, it's uh, across, you know, epilepsy, autism, well, you can read them there. I'm not going to go through them. They do have a common theme, however, and it's to do with, and that's not surprising in molecular medicine, molecular stratification of patient populations to inform decision making, re-effectiveness of drugs, adverse drug reactions, intervention strategies, and disease management. And they all have an economic rationale behind that. So for example, the first one on the list is epilepsy, and uh, you know, a third of the epilepsy patients that come in do terribly on traditional anti-epileptic -epile drugs. So you don't want to put those people on, on traditional anti-epileptic drugs. And so we, uh, the project is to do with def by, uh, getting a new diagnostic test to, together to differentiate those populations that will do well and, and, and not. Um, I thought I'd just uh, give you a flavor of the type of uh, project. So this one is in... Uh, in lymphoid cancer run by Joseph Connors at the British Columbia Cancer Agency with linked to, of course, the high-end sequencing center there directed by Marco Mara. And in this one, the, the, the beauty, of, beauty of, of this project was that Joe had gone around the province of British Columbia and had signed on every single clinical oncologist specialized in hematological cancers and, and brought them into the, the team and got them to sign on to say that, you know, yes, if this works, then we will apply it uh, to my cohort of patients, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a, a very interesting one. There's also one on prenatal aneuploidy screening, uh, and this is looking at direct comparison with uh, several technologies head-to-head, -head, uh, and, and obviously you can imagine some of the gels uh, related research that's going on uh, in that uh, project. Everybody has their favorite story on rare disease. Uh, this one, these guys have gone through uh, uh, the usual diagnostic odyssey and um, uh, for a d over a decade and uh, uh, of course three weeks after their genome sequenced, uh, their, their uh, disease was solved. Uh, now Kim Boycott and her group have solved uh, over um, 150 uh, cases uh, out of 200 fami 250 families that uh, have been looked at, so that's a 60% a hit rate. Uh, I'm not going to go through this because I'm now running out of time. And I'll just go through some of the conclusions and the future uh, uh, aspects. So obviously we need to look, concentrate on the receptor, and we're hoping that some of these projects that we're funding will deal with some of these issues. Uh, involvement of the private sector is key. There are 20 
uh, companies that are involved in the portfolio of the 17 projects that we're funding. So there is a, quite a lot of uh, uh, industrial um, uh, 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 interaction. And you can read those, the, the other things on the list are obviously uh, very similar to what you've already heard from the others. Uh, we have created in Canada, and this is a, 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 um, a unique thing in, in Canada for the moment. It's one of the first pediatric clinical genomic centers in the world. It's a partnership between St. Justine Ho University Hospital and Genome Quebec, and will be a very interesting one to, uh, to follow as a model for the, the system. So as, uh, uh, as Francis Collins always says, you know, this is the beginning of something and not the end of something. Uh, the knowledge base will be totally different in five years once again, and we'll be layering proteomics, epigenomics, micro, microbiome data on top of our personal genome sequence, and that is going to have huge informatic challenges that da uh, Dan uh, uh, told us about uh, earlier on. Um, but it will mean that in 10 years, technology will allow us to do things that are totally unimaginable today. So I'd just like to acknowledge the genome centers, uh, which we, w w is very much of a, a family in, in Canada uh, in terms of the genomics enterprise that we've created. And of course, our, our partners, um, uh, it has been a superb uh, uh, partnership with, with uh, CIHR and of course, all my colleagues at Genome Canada for uh, all of their help in putting this together. Thanks very much for your attention. I think I have a couple of minutes for questions, if there are any. This is a question that I have because I've, I've sort of been involved in the Genome Quebec uh, uh, post-award evaluation. You, you've, you've invested a huge, or you are investing a huge amount of money in, in 17 different projects. Is there, is there some kind of plan to create a common infrastructure in terms of a, a genomic database or exchange of information or <laughs> lessons learned across these 17 individual projects? There's a big investment in the individual projects. How about the sort of the collective and how are you, how are you approaching that? Ter terrific uh, question, Dan. Thank you. And uh, I mentioned that we were going to bring these, once they were launched, we're going to bring these 17 together in April of this year. And we're going to ask them exactly that question. What can we do to try and harmonize what you're doing, to integrate data sets, to make sure uh, that we're, we're, we're harmonizing as much as we can do across these 17 different projects that are scattered across the country? And there is a link here between uh, Canada getting prepared to uh, be a credible partner in the Global Alliance uh, and, and being able to integrate some of this uh, uh, stuff across the 17 projects. So it's a great question, and I'll, I'll be able to tell you more after April, at the April meeting then. So thanks. <laughs>